Hello and welcome back to the Crash Course Guide for Foundation Block. Today we're going to be looking at, in part 2, protein synthesis and the cell and membrane transport. So let's get started by having a look at protein synthesis. First of all, let's have a look at some building blocks. Remember, proteins make up all living material, and proteins are composed of amino acids. Now there are 20 different amino acids, and by combining these in different combinations we make up lots of different proteins and proteins are made by ribosomes in the cytoplasm of a cell. So, what are the functions of proteins? Well, they help fight disease, they build new body tissue, they're enzymes used for digestion and other chemical reactions, and they're also a component of all cell membranes, which we'll look at in the next video. So, we have DNA and RNA, and what is the difference? Well, DNA has deoxyribose sugar, it contains A, T, C, and G, remember T stands for thymine, and it's double-stranded. In comparison to RNA, which is a ribose sugar as opposed to a deoxyribose sugar, it contains U instead of T, and it's single-stranded instead of double-stranded. And this is really essential for protein synthesis. This is a little activity you can have a go at on your own, so it says transcribe each strand of DNA into a complete complementary strand of mRNA. So remember T will be A and A will be U in the new strand because it is RNA and so on. It's a good opportunity to practice and cement it in your brain. So the three types of RNA. So you might have seen in the last slide mRNA which may be a little confusing. Well there are three types of RNA. So there's rRNA, mRNA and tRNA. So rRNA is located in the nucleus and ribosome, and its function is to combine with proteins to make ribosomes. mRNA is located in the nucleus and cytoplasm, and its function is to bring instructions from DNA in the nucleus to ribosomes in the cytoplasm. And tRNA, this is located in the nucleus and cytoplasm as well, and this brings amino acids to ribosomes to build the proteins themselves. So this will become a lot clearer when we look at the process of protein synthesis. So we can think about protein synthesis in two stages. We have transcription and translation. And transcription must come first before we can translate anything. As, for example, if you're wanting to translate a language, you might want to write it down first, i.e. transcript it, before you can translate it. So let's have a look at transcription first. So this is the copying of DNA in the nucleus to mRNA. So we'll look at it in word format first, and then we'll have a look at it in the format of pictures, which will be good depending on which way you learn. So RNA polymerase binds to the DNA and separates the two strands. RNA polymerase then uses one strand of DNA as a template to assemble nucleotides into mRNA. And then the mRNA leaves the nucleus. And bear in mind throughout this process, promoters are regions of DNA that show where RNA polymerase must bind to to begin the transcription of RNA. So in picture form, this is basically what happens. This is within inside the nucleus. The DNA is breaking up and a complementary strand of mRNA is forming, which is much lighter and can easily leave the nucleus through one of these pores. The mRNA then travels outside of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Which brings us on to translation, the next step. So translation is the process of decoding the mRNA into a polypeptide chain, in other words, into a protein. So ribosomes read the mRNA three bases, or codon at a time, and construct the protein. So this is broken down into initiation, elongation, and termination. So again, the ribosomes read the mRNA bases three at a time, and three mRNA bases is the same as a codon. And this matches them with tRNA attached to an amino acid. And an amino acid chain then forms from many peptide bonds. So this is actually a lot easier to understand in picture form. This is your mRNA strand that has left the nucleus and come into the cytoplasm, and it's attached to this ribosome. So then, attaching to this mRNA, tRNA is coming to it and complementary bases are attaching, and at the end of the tRNA is an amino acid, for example lysine or tyrosine. And so then these join together via peptide bonds, and it's the joining of these um, amino acids here at the end of the tRNA which form your peptide. So you can see the peptide bonds between them there. And this protein is then folded, so a polypeptide is just a long chain of amino acids linked by peptide bonds, 
and several polypeptides are folded together to form a protein. So making a protein by building amino acids is essentially what happens. And this table is really important to be able to read. So for example, you need a first position, a second position, and a third position in your codon. So say we have A, U, and G. By mixing all of these together, so A, then we're looking in this box, so U, and then we're looking at G, we end up with this amino acid here. So that is how you read one of these tables. So summary, this is a nice diagram showing it all in one. So transcription, remember DNA to mRNA within the nucleus and leaves the nucleus via one of these pores through the nuclear membrane. mRNA comes out into the cytoplasm and attaches to a ribosome. The codons are read by the uh, ribosome and tRNA comes down and attaches to the mRNA via complementary base pairing. And attached to the end of the tRNA is a amino acid, which joined together with amino uh, with peptide bonds, sorry, and this forms a polypeptide chain, which is then folded into a protein. So next we look at the cell and membrane transport. So the membrane is a double layer of proteins and lipids, and it separates the cytoplasm of the cell from its surroundings. It is selectively permeable and controls what can and can't enter the cell. So oxygen, CO2 and water can easily pass across the cell membrane. But highly charged molecules such as ions cannot directly pass through and they must use proteins embedded in the membrane to facilitate their movement. So we've just learned how to make a protein through protein synthesis and now we're going to be using them in the membrane in order to transport things across. And the membrane is made up of these phospholipids which have got a hydrophilic head, in other words it's attracted to water, and a hydrophobic tail, in other words it's repelled by water. So phospholipids are the main component of the cell membrane. And lipid molecules are made up of the head and the two fatty acid tails, as we've just talked about. And this forms a double-layered membrane. So the cell membrane also contains things such as glycolipids and cholesterol. And cholesterol is important to regulate the fluidity of the cell membrane. So if we have less cholesterol, more fluid membrane, and more permeable to molecules. And therefore vice versa, so effective, we have more cholesterol. And remember, proteins also make up the cell membrane. And many are transmembrane proteins. In other words, they cover the whole of the membrane, and some are just covering part of it. So this is a lovely picture of a cell membrane. But if we think about it more simply, it looks a little bit like this. So we have lots of um, phospholipids all lined up in a bilayer. Now also making up the phospholipid bilayer are things like this proteins and these can allow molecules to pass across and these can either be uniporters i.e they make things travel in one direction only symporters so two things can travel through at once but only in one direction or antiporters where two things can travel but in opposite directions across the membrane and these are all the different types of um, proteins that can exist within the phospholipid bilayer but to simplify that a little bit more they look a little bit like this so we can have a receptor that binds to chemical messengers such as hormones sent from other cells. We can have ion channels constantly open and allow ions to pass in and out of the cell. We can have gated ion channels, which means they only open selectively at certain times when the um, gate is charged to a certain level. And we can also have G-protein coupled receptors, which are the biggest mystery of all, which bind GTP and GDP and cause a secondary messenger to be released with inside the cell. And we'll talk about these a little bit more in a moment. So, substances can enter a cell either passively via simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion or osmosis, or actively, so molecules and charged particles. So firstly, simple and facilitated diffusion. So simple diffusion... Diffusion is the net passive movement of particles from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. And it continues until the concentration of substances is the same on both sides of the membrane. For example, O2 and CO2 move in this way. Facilitated diffusion, so the movement of specific molecules down the concentration gradient again, passing through the membrane via a specific carrier protein this time. And each carrier has got its own shape and allows only one type of molecule to pass through. So it's passive and requires no energy from the cell. And for example, glucose moves in this way. Active transport. 
is the energy demanding transfer of a substance across a cell membrane against its concentration gradient. So it's moving things from an area of higher concent uh, lower concentration to an area of higher concentration, and therefore it must be powered by ATP. And things like sodium and potassium move in this way, and also reabsorbing glucose in the uh, proximal convoluted tubule of the kidneys. Endo and exocytosis are other processes which allow movement. So this is a movement of very large molecules across the cell membrane. It involves a fusion of vesicles, which contain the molecule it's moving with the cell membrane. And then there, um, the substances destined for secretion are packaged in the Golgi body. And pinocytosis is the uptake of a large molecule from solution. And phagocytosis is the uptake of a solid particle by a cell. Iron channels cannot uh, iron channels are present because ions cannot diffuse across the hydrophobic barrier of the lipid bilayer. So ion channels provide a polar environment for diffusion of ions across that membrane. And they've got three functional properties to conduct, select, and gate. So a quick look at the sodium-potassium pump. So free sodium in the cytoplasm binds to the pump. And sodium binding stimulates phosphorylation of the pump by ATP. And phosphorylation causes the protein to change its conformation, which allows sodium to move to the outside. At the same time, extracellularly, where the sodium is moving to, potassium binds to the protein times 2 and triggers the release of recently bound phosphate groups. Loss of this restores the protein's original conformation and the process repeats and the potassium can move intracellularly from extracellularly. The sodium-potassium pump is vital in numerous body functions such as nerve cell signaling, heart contractions and kidney function. Next, we think about receptors, and a receptor is just a membrane-bound or soluble protein or protein complex which exerts a physiological effect after binding to its natural ligand. And a natural ligand is just something that binds to a receptor. So with regard to cell and membrane transport, receptors contain a binding site that is recognised by the chemical messenger. And then when we bind to this chemical binding site, it results in an induced fit of the receptor protein. So change in shape results in a domino effect, and this is the signal transduction. So in other words, as you can see here, the messenger binds to the receptor, opens the receptor up, and the message is transmitted to the inside of the cell, and so on. The messenger is released. G-protein coupled receptors are possibly the biggest mystery, and largest and most diverse group of receptors. They're implicated in many diseases and therefore a massive target for therapeutics, and that, for that reason it's very important that you know about them. So the structure of a G-protein coupled receptor is that it's a single polypeptide folded into a globular shape and embedded in a cell's plasma membrane. So there are seven segments to a G-protein coupled receptor which span the width of the membrane. And what we mean by that is it crosses the membrane seven times. So G-protein coupled receptors interact with G-proteins in the plasma membrane and binding of a GPCR with a ligand causes a change within the protein coupled receptor allowing it to interact with G-proteins. It then binds to GTP or DGP, and activa activation of the uh, G protein coupled receptor leads to production of adenyl cyclase, and this is an enzyme that catalyzes the synthesis of a secondary messenger from ATP. An example of a secondary messenger is CAMP. Don't worry about the terminology here, just be aware that the G protein coupled receptor causes the release of a secondary messenger inside the cell, which causes the action to occur. So here we see our phospholipid bilayer again. And this is our G-protein coupled receptor, which we can see crosses the membrane seven times. A ligand binds to the GPCR, such as GTP. It undergoes a conformational change and activates adenyl cyclase, which is that enzyme inside the cell, which causes ATP to be released and become CAMP, which is a secondary messenger, which will then go on to carry out the effects which it needs to in the cell. That's all it is. So a summary here, this is it all in wording, but basically what we've just explained um, in a simple diagram format. And that's everything for this video. I hope you found it useful. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you for listening.